This video introduces constraints into a dual mode predictive control problem. The previous video then demonstrated the principle of how constraints can be tested over an infinite horizon using just a finite number of inequalities. And we used this concept of a maximal admissible set. And for that, we did assume that the asymptotic value was strictly inside the constraints. The existence of an asymptotic value implicitly means that the transition matrix has got stable eigenvalues. And we're not going to look at um, problems where maybe some of the poles are on the unit circle. Our next challenge is to take these concepts and say, how might we apply them to the OMPC and SOMPC algorithms so that we can put constraint handling into those algorithms. The maximum admissible set then. So what we said is if you had a transition or state transition, something like this, x k plus 1 equals a x k, and we wanted to satisfy constraints at every sample of the form g x k is less than or equal to f, where f was strictly bigger than 0. So if you want to be uh, pedantic, I could put a minus epsilon there where epsilon is greater than zero, some finite number. And if we had that the limit as k goes to infinity of a to the k equals zero, sorry, I shouldn't have gone, then what we could do is we could show putting all this together, we could guarantee that constraints satisfy the sample constraints, or sorry, the state satisfy constraints all the way up to infinity if the initial condition satisfied some equalities a bit like this. And the previous video showed how we might calculate f and calculate t um, for these particular conditions. Now, what we did is we showed that in general, this f matrix and this t vector can be written using a finite number of inequalities where we had ga, ga squared, and so on down to ga to the n times xk is less than or equal to f. So in other words, if we satisfy the sample constraints for the first n samples, then we can ensure that it satisfies them thereafter. And the way we did that is we did a simple linear program. That's this one here. We tried to find the maximum over x of ga to the n plus 1 times xk subject to fx less than t, and we had a simple condition. If we can force a violation, that is, if we can make this g a to the n plus 1 xk bigger than f, then we can force a violation. Then um, n is not big enough, and we need to increase it. But if we cannot force a violation, then n is large enough. And that was covered in the previous video. So that was the definition of our maximal admissible set. So next, what we need to do is look at our OMPC and SOMPC algorithm in this context. In essence, we're saying we need to express predictions in this form because our maximal admissible set assumed that the state evolved using an equation like this. We also have to express sample constraints in this form because that's the assumption we made for our maximal admissible set. If we can do that, if we can make OMPC look like this, then we can use the standard MAS iterations in order to handle constraints. So how can we do this? Well, the trick is we're going to use this thing called the autonomous model formulation. First of all, let's look at the OMPC prediction setup. What we had was two modes. That's why some people call it dual mode. You'll notice in the first mode, we had a control law, u equals minus kx plus c, and the state transition, xk plus 1 equals 5xk plus bc. So that's for the first nc steps. And in the second mode, we just resorted to the simple equations, xk plus 1 equals 5xk, uk equals minus kx squared. And you're looking at that, and you're saying, well, that doesn't look like the form that I need. However, I'm going to use a bit of sleight of hand here. What I'm going to do is build an augmented state vector. There it is, xk plus 1, c future, k plus 1. And I'm going to call that z. Now, if you take these equations here on the left and express them in terms of this augmented vector z, then what you find is you get this transition matrix psi, which relates you back to z of k. So you'll notice I've got phi and b, 
which matches the phi and b here. <coughs> So that's your simple um, top equation. And then for taking this C future forward, you'll notice we just had this upper um, diagonal matrix of identities. The key thing is, it's well defined, it's easy to define. Now if I wanted to define my U, then you'll find the dependence of U on this Z is given by this expression here. You'll see I've got minus K, so that's the minus K here. And then I've got plus CK, which does that term there. And the key thing here is what you've noticed is we have expressed our predictions in a very simple form. Our predictions now have this simple state transition. ZK plus 1 equals psi ZK. And if I need the inputs, I also know the simple dependence between the inputs and this state Z. So, if I had limits on the input, something like u less than uk less than u over bar, and limits on the states, cx less than or equal to x over bar, then I can express these in terms of my new state z. So you'll remember I had that u equals minus kz times z. So what I can do is I can simply write these constraints in terms of z, and that's this box here. In a similar way, if I had simple state constraints, cx less than or equal to x bar, I can write those in terms of z, and that's what I've done here. I'm not covering input rates here, because input rates don't come out neatly from this particular model. If you do want rates, then you're going to have to augment this model with an additional state so that you can define the rates from that, and I'll leave that for you to do by yourself. So now let's combine all these constraints together. So what we do is we just stack them all and we say at every sample these are the constraints written in terms of my augmented variable z. And what do you like about this is you'll notice it's written as g z k less than or equal to f. So let's look at how we've got all these things together. We've said that we can express the predictions using a model like this, zk plus 1 equals psi zk. We've said we can explain the constraints at each sample, or define them, in this form here, g zk less than or equal to f. And if you look at those two expressions, what do you notice? They have exactly the same structure as the expressions we used to form our admissible set. So x k plus 1 equals axk looks just like this one up here, except we've got a different state. gxk less than or equal to f looks just like this one here. So we've got exactly the same structure, and therefore we can plug these directly into our MAS algorithm in order to test constraints for our OMPC predictions. Now just a note at the bottom, the corresponding sets are going to be called MCAS not MAS, not MAS, because they include within them the degrees of freedom CK. So in other words, it's called the maximal controlled admissible set. OK, so what we've got, when we found this MCAS, here it is, FZK less than or equal to T, you'll probably find that it's convenient to re-expand our vector z, there it is, our vector z is x over c future, and therefore separate this f into two separate blocks, m and n, because by doing that, I can actually map back to my original x space. So my s m cas, the set within which I can actually solve the problem, is all the values for x, such that there exists a c future, such that n c future plus m x k less than or equal to t. And what you'll find is this representation is the one that you're going to be using in your OMPC algorithm. So you've separated out again the degrees of freedom in C and the dependence on the initial state. So we've used the admissible set algorithm using state Z in order to get F and T, but then we've unpacked F and T in order to implement it in OMPC. So some code then to demonstrate that this works. We're only going to give a few examples because this is just an introduction and 
so far with just looking at the regulation problem that is targets of zero. So we're just going to demonstrate that everything works and we're also going to make a point that for some of the set projections we're using a toolbox from ETH. I'll give the link in a bit. Two examples are given here. We've got video 5.9 example 1 and video 5.9 example 2. So I'll just as ever demonstrate those algorithms before we move to the next step. So here's video 5.9 example 1 and you'll see as ever you've got an A, B, C matrix and a D so that's your state space model. You've got your Q's and your R's. You've got your constraints. There you are. U min, U max constraints on the state. Um, so if I just run this pressing F5 and you'll find what this has done is it's given you the constrained OMPC algorithm, it's given you the evolutions there. But the bottom line is you can go and you can say, oh, I want to change U min, I want to change U max, I want to change A, I want to change B. Easy to do. If I look at example two, slightly different example, again, you'll see it's got the numbers up there for you to change. I can just run this and it comes up with a number of plots. So as ever, the code is there so you can explore and experiment if you want. And what we'll do next is we'll focus on the results. So first of all, video 5.9, example 1. And the key thing you're going to notice here is we have a non-zero CK at the first sample. So in other words, the constraint handling has said, I need to use CK not equal to zero. And you'll notice by putting that, I've actually got the input on the constraint limit, which is what I expected. So what we're demonstrating here <coughs> is that the algorithm works. By calculating our constraint inequalities in the form NC future plus MX less than or equal to D, and plugging those into our OMPC algorithm, then we can actually find an appropriate C to ensure that we satisfy constraints. You'll remember that the early results, we said that we expected the cost function to be Lyapunov. And what do you expect? What do you see? It is still Lyapunov. If you look at the state evolutions, you'll find this state does indeed come to the origin as expected. So that's a relatively simple example. What about the second example? Well, we've got the same illustration here. If you look at the um, I think you might call it the pink line down here, you'll see the pink line always satisfies constraints and you'll also notice it's using non-zero CK to make sure that we satisfy constraints. If you were to do the unconstrained control law, which is the green line, you'll find the unconstrained law chooses inputs which violate constraints and therefore would not be allowed. Now let's have a look <coughs> at what we get in the state plane. So what we've got down here is x1 on this axis and x2 on this axis. And the dotted lines, as ever, show you the constraints at each sample. Now if you look at the constrained solution, you'll find the state trajectories always stay inside your constraints. They always satisfy constraints. If you were to follow the unconstrained, then what do you notice? They actually do not satisfy your constraints. So here's an example where you have to do proper constraint handling because otherwise your state trajectories will not satisfy your constraints. So that's an, an, an illustration of the fact the algorithm is working. It's doing what you want it to do. Now what this plot shows is the sets. This yellow bit is the MAS. So that's what happens, in essence, if C equals 0. So if you assume that you're only using U equals minus KX, then you will only satisfy constraints if you start inside this yellow box. If you start outside the yellow box, then U equals minus KX will lead to constraint violations. And that's what you can see with this unconstrained. You can see you get constraint violations um, because you're not inside the yellow box. What about this larger area here? What this larger area is, it's the MCAS. It's this, the region within which, if you use U equals minus KX plus C, I can find a C such that the trajectories satisfy 
constraints. And what you notice is the MCAS is much bigger than the MAS. So it's showing you the benefits of adding this perturbation term. It says if I add that perturbation term, then I can take X to a much larger region and still ensure my predictions satisfy constraints. And of course, that's what you're seeing here. You've started a long way out, but you still satisfied the original constraints. Now, if you want to produce some of these sets, you'll notice there's a link here. Pause the video if you want to um, copy that link, which is where we got the software from. So in summary, this video has shown how an invariant set, or MCAS, can be constructed for the OMPC or SOMPC algorithm. The set ensures that predictions satisfy constraints over an infinite horizon, but using a finite number of qualities. We've done some simulations of OMPC using a regulation problem to demonstrate the algorithm works. We do handle the constraints. We do end up on the limits where appropriate. The cost is still the Apanov, as expected. And also, though we didn't dwell on this, you'll notice that values for C have a strong pattern which is consistent with a well-posed problem structure.